Black College with roots in the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church that motivates and prepares students to seek knowledge which leads to intellectual and civic empowerment. The Miles College education engages students in rigorous study, scholarly inquiry, and spiritual awareness, enabling graduates to become lifelong learners and responsible citizens who help shape our global society. Through its coursework, community development projects, and philanthropic partnerships, Miles College students graduate with the knowledge and wisdom needed to reach their full potential and thrive in a shifting 21st century landscape. Learn more today about Miles College. To donate, learn more about course information, or to schedule a visit, go to miles.edu. Since 1898, the concept
morning. Good morning, Miles College. Certainly, it is indeed a great day at Miles College. And we are excited to celebrate President Bobby Knight's Black History Month Speaker Series. Um, we're going to go ahead and begin our program. Uh, we'd ask uh, if you would uh, silence your cellular devices. program will proceed as printed, and so at this time let us receive uh, the Reverend Larry Beatty, Dean of Student Life Engagement in Chapel, who will give our invocation, followed by Dr. Libby Cook. I believe this afternoon now. Breathe on us now, O oh God. Help us to center ourselves now. We invoke your presence to be here with us. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who hast brought us thus far on the way, thou who hast by thy might let us into the light. Keep us forever in the path, we pray. You kept us through slavery, segregation, Jim Crowism, and even now through voter suppression, racial discrimination, and gerrymandering. We thank you for the freedom fighters of the past who stood tall and boldly against racism of their day. Though impregnated with the frailties of humanity, you still use them to speak truth to power, as you are using men and women like Al Sharpton and Bobby Knight even today. Speak now to this generation. Help them to understand how privileged they are to have an opportunity to stay and work and walk the hollow grounds of Miles College, where young men and women stood boldly against racism in the fight for human dignity. Help them to also understand that with privilege comes great responsibility. We invoke your presence here with us today. Use this forum to encourage and inspire another generation of freedom fighters. We yield now to hear from you. Speak now to us. We stop to listen to what you have to say through your servant today. We yield our spirits, our minds, our bodies, and our souls to hear from you. Speak, Lord, as only you can speak, that we may be able to answer the questions. Why are you here? What is your purpose for being? What do you hope to accomplish? What are your goals? We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Institution. 
as it marks our launch of the Center for Economic and Social Justice, as it was erected out of a presidential initiative in 2020. The mission of the Center is to create a vibrant ecosystem that fosters innovative thinking, scholarly research, and entrepreneurial ideas that promote systems of economic and social prosperity. Our vision is to equip scholars, both new and seasoned, practitioners, and business owners with resources to affect positive change at the social, political, and economic levels. We do this through advocacy, education, engagement, and development. Though I like to tell people we are a small but mighty team, our efforts would not be possible without this esteemed advisory council, which includes the Chair of the Board of Trustees, Bishop Teresa E. Jefferson Snorton, President Bobby Knight, Dr. Richard Arrington, Mr. Chuck Falsh, Dr. LaRonda McGross, Ms. Ilyasa Shabazz, and Mr. Rock Williams. So again, on behalf of Mouse College, the Center, and our advisory council, welcome. We are excited to have each of you here as we gain another perspective from Reverend Al Sharpen on how and why the time is now. But before I do, I'd like to welcome Ms. Christian Lawrence to the podium to bring the SGA greetings. Greetings and good morning. I am Kristen Lawrence, the SGA president for this academic school year, and I want to welcome everyone on behalf of the SGA executive panel and student body to this special occasion. We all know how important it is to learn about our black history, but black history isn't just black history, it's history. Nothing compares to hearing from those who have made black history and continue to do so, and it is an honor to be here today. Today, we will gain a better understanding of how we can be intentional with our effort and how to enact positive change around us. It is an honor and privilege that Reverend Al Sharpton is here with us today, and I want to thank everyone for swimming out here today and urge you all to take his message to heart because the time for change is now. And now, to the Stephen Parker with the introduction of our speaker. Well, Miles College family, I am so excited for this moment. Aren't you excited? Yes. Okay, so get those hands ready. Yes. It gives me a great honor to introduce a man uh, who is a renowned civil rights leader, founder, and president of the National Action Network, and that of the Reverend Al Sharpton. He is a drum major for justice. He is a God-fearing man. He is one who is approachable and one who does not mind fighting for the downtrodden, fighting for the least of these. And so without further ado, will you please stand and give a round of applause to our drum major of justice, the Reverend Al Sharpton. Come on, put those hands. Therefore, what we do. 
and to be an expert on how great we were and not exhibit that greatness in the contemporary setting is offensive to those that pay the price to get us where we are. There is a raging debate in this country that has been politicized. We're in uh, the middle of a midterm election year. We're in the beginning of it. And the raging debate around critical race theory, which is nothing but a deviation and a distraction that they come up all the time. I mean, in the 80s, it was the welfare lady. It was, uh, it's always some race tinged uh, effort that you to help to generate some excitement among a certain base that would be appealed to by racist language. Because critical race theory is not really uh, an existing uh, issue. First of all, critical race theory is done in some law schools at a very graduate level. They're not in public schools. They're not in most colleges. But it is a good way for them to say that blacks are, are, are indoctrinating whites uh, uh, with guilt and hate and generating things that's not true. The fact of the matter is you cannot do American history without dealing with black history. <laughs> so when you see certain states today that say that we do not want to teach anything, the state of Florida has a law. Uh, and other states are, uh, the, gov the new governor of Virginia said we should not have lessons that make whites uncomfortable. Well, how do you teach history where you have to teach the, to the comfort of those you teach? Uh, most history makes us uncomfortable. And if people are uncomfortable, then they don't want history. They want to go to the guidance council and get comfortable. <laughs> so the fact of the matter is that when we were brought to these shores as blacks in 1619, what a lot of us miss is that we were brought Jamestown, Virginia, Charleston, South Carolina, Port of New York, 1619 was the beginning. They did not structure and formalize the country until 1776. We had been enslaved for over a century and a half before they formalized the country. Which means that when they, in 1776, did the Bill of Rights, we only choose to be self-evident that all men are created equal, they were not talking about us. Because we were already enslaved and already being as less than men or women that was eating. So then in, in, in uh, 1789 when they formed the Constitution, all, for all of that was done where blacks were delegated to property. How they justified it is with racism. They did the slave trade with Africa, brought us across the Atlantic, Many of us, if not most of us, died on the journey. Those that made it were enslaved. Families were divided. They would sell daddy to Alabama, mama to North Carolina, the children to Virginia, never to be reconciled. Because they knew that there was a family bond that you could, based on that bond, organize and rebel against slavery. And there were rebellions anyway. So the main thing they do is first they have to break us up. If they can break us up and divide us, there is no common bond that will make us unite and fight together for our situation. So one of the tactics have always been to divide. That's from the days that we got here. Second is to have us to feel that we are less than we are. So what did they do? They reduced us to less than, by law, three-fifths of a man, took our names, and you didn't know your name by the second generation because you didn't know your grandma, and you didn't know your grandpa, but you didn't invite them, you didn't know your mom, and you were named after them. I remember in 2007, 
A reporter called me from the New York Daily News and said, uh, Reverend Shopton is around, uh, he really called me around December 2006. He said for our February 2007 special on Black History Month, we want to do a uh, family tree search on uh, well-known black. And we like to do your family tree. Have you ever done it? I said, no. He said, uh, would you agree? I said, yes. And he went and interviewed me. I knew my grandfather on my father and mother's side. You know, my father left when I was young. And uh, that's about as far back as I can go. He came back to me in January 2007. And the surprising thing is he came to my office this time with another reporter and a photographer. I said, well, what is this? I thought it was just a little, y'all was going to put me in the list of uh, who y'all consider well-known Negroes. <laughs> <laughs> now y'all got all this. He said, well, let me ask you a question. He said, have you ever heard of Coleman Shop? Yeah, that was my grandfather's name. He said, but your grandfather was Coleman Shop Jr. I said, no, I didn't know that. He said, his father was Coleman Shopton Senior. I said, no, I never knew that. He said, and his father was a slave in Edgefield, South Carolina. I said, no, I, I really didn't know that. I said, my father and my grandfather on my father's side was from Florida. He said, well, that's true. And that's how we found this out. Because going through the record, in Florida, we found that a lady had given some servitude, lent out her slaves to do work in Florida because her husband died and she needed money and she would send her slaves down with an economic arrangement with people in Florida. And your father was, your grand, great grandfather was one of them, and we had the papers where she paid for Coleman Shopping and the other slave. I said, I didn't know that. He said, well, it gets more interesting than that. The lady's name, her husband's name, was Alexander Shopping. And that's where y'all got the name Shopping. And her name was Anna Thurman Shopping. She was the great aunt to the segregation of Senator Strong Thurman. So the Thurman, on y'all. I said, are you serious? He said, yeah. So I said, well, Edgeville, South Carolina, exactly where that is. He said, well, you should go down there because they are still the churches and all that are there. Many of the churches in the South are over 100 years old. I decided to go down there. I took some uh, black reporters with me and others gathered. And we went to the first Baptist church in Edgefield, the white church. And when you go in the cemetery of the white church, about a third of that cemetery were the Thurmans and the shop. While I was walking around looking at the tombstones of my great-grandfather's master, elderly black man came up, he saw the TV camera, and he said, uh, Reverend Al, he said, you know, a collector kept the plantation where your great-grandfather was a slave. I said, well, where is that? He said, it's about a half a mile from me. I said, let's get a car. I want to see this. So we got in the cars, drove over there. And when we turned, the name of the street was Sharpton Road. And I've been to South Carolina a thousand times. I never knew there was a road named after my slave. And we toured the plantation. As we finished here, you know, toured the plantation, we got back in the car, ready to head back to New York. And we were getting ready to head to the airport. I said, where is I-20? He said, about half a mile from here. I said, go get on I-20. They got on I-20, turned uh, south. And the next exit, I said, get off here. They said, get off here. I said, yes. They got off at that next exit. I said, turn left. They turned left. And we went about a quarter of a mile. And the quarter of a mile, which was no more than three quarters of a mile from where my great grandfather was a slave, was the estate and mansion of James Brown, who helped raise me. Godfather soul. I say that story to say that we all are in a zone of history that we do not know. And I tell people all the time when I speak in different 
colleges, universities, or, or settings. And I told this to President Biden. You must understand that when they're arguing about critical race or really black history, every time I write my name, I'm writing the ownership of my great grandfather. Sharpton is a social economic designation. It is not passed down from West Africa. It was my name of ownership. And every time I write my name, I should remember how I got that name. The fact of the matter is that we have gone through eras of slavery into the Civil War. Do not forget, when they fought the Civil War and the battle was between the North and the South, the Confederates against the Union, they were losing. The Union was losing. There were those that had gone to President Abraham Lincoln and said, you need to let us enlist some of the blacks because we are fighting and losing in certain areas. He didn't want to hear it. No, we're not going to do that. As they began progressing north, that is far on one side as, as Maryland, on the other side is Virginia. And they were afraid that they would not get as close as taking Washington, D.C. He reluctantly said, I will free the slaves in the south. He didn't free the slaves in the north. And let them enlist, enlist in the Union Army. And when the blacks in the south were put in the Union Army and fought back, they defeated General Robert E. Lee and backed him up, which is why it is a misnomer history that Lincoln freed the slave. The slave really freed Lincoln. <laughs> and out of that, he made the commitment to the abolitionists, Frederick Douglass and all of them, that he would make the Emancipation Proclamation happen when they would free the slave January 1st, 1863. Many of us go to watch night service at church, and we wonder why we worship different than whites on New Year's Eve. And many of us worship until midnight run out to the party. <laughs> you y'all laughing, so y'all must be guilty. <laughs> I, I know when I was growing up, brother, that the church was packed until about 10 after 12. And then everybody was going to the, to the boogie boot down or whatever. But, Watch night was not waiting on the Holy Ghost to come. Watch night was the slaves were waiting to see at midnight if Lincoln was going to keep his commitment. That's where watch night came from. So watch night was different from us than watch. And the commitment was kept. And they went and they were free. But that's why the, the economic history that y'all are building becomes so important. Freedom without getting the resources is not freedom at all. We were free to be servants. We were free to be broke. Where do you go when you have three or four generations that had no income, no land, nothing to work, so they free you to really put you in another form of slavery? So when General Sherman said that I'm going to take a certain a, a miles of acreage and give it to the slaves and break the acreage up, that's where 40 acres came from. The next president came and revoked that, which is why I spoke this important. Because if Sherman had his way, we'd all been on acres between Carolina and Florida. That was revoked by President Johnson and we therefore went through a reconstruction era. In that reconstruction era, we started building an economic institution. The black church became our headquarters. It was not only our spiritual headquarters, our black colleges, our black banks, our black economic institutions all came out of the black church. The first thing black folks owned and operated in this country was the black church. We were in charge of the black church. And we saw the role model of leadership in the black church. And out of that group, and that's why I tell a lot of my contemporaries, a lot of young people in our organization, National National Network, that you cannot talk about 
Well, I don't relate to that. That is what gave us our self-esteem. I, I grew up, as an aside, I grew up a boy preacher. So, well, I would be in church all the time. Pastor was black, chairman of the trustee board was black, chairman of the board was black, everybody was black. So I did not know nothing about whites in charge until I went to school. So I was already a doctor. You couldn't tell me what blacks couldn't do because I grew up seeing that we could run big institutions. The Reconstruction era was started that we got the right to vote. We elected and put in office 22 blacks in Congress and the Senate. But then, backlash. Another president comes in, cancels all of that, and leaves the Tilden Days Compromise where they relieved all of the soldiers in the South, compromise was that we'll let Haiti be president, till then even though you got more votes in certain areas, certain counties, we'll back up as long as you release the South. Release the South means that we can do what we want to the blacks and they re-enslaved us. Yes. Took our right to vote. And we went from 22 blacks in Congress and the Senate to none. It was reinforced by the Ku Klux Klan and the terrorists at the bottom. Supreme Court rulings took away, Plessy versus Ferguson and other rulings took away our legal rights. By the turn of the century, by 1900, we had no blacks in Congress. And no rights anyone was bound to respect. And they were lynching thousands of us. And you must remember, lynching was a social event. They would not just take you out of the woods and lynch you. They would lynch you in the center of the building. People would come like it was a picnic at the church on Sunday. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Pack their sandwiches yes, and watch them hang the black yeah. in the court yard downtown. And then out of that movement started. NAACP founded in 1906, early three years later, fighting the anti-lynching movement. That was that era. Then it went into World War I and II, World War I in the, in the late 19-teens. In that period, we started organizing labor and the women's movement, yeah. which was part of, of blacks and his fight. A. Philip Randolph and others emerged. That was that era. Into the 50s, where Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund started fighting Brown versus the Board of Education to get equal education. Every era had a fight. 1955, young black man, young black teenager from Chicago, visited his family in Mississippi. They accused him of whistling at a white woman and killed him, Emmett Till. Emmett Till's mother brought his body back to Chicago and wanted to expose to the world what they did to her son and refused to have a closed casting funeral. And when people saw how he was beaten and brutalized and drowned, it began to enrage people, white and black, around this country to go against these lynchings. A year later, a lady sat in front of us in Montgomery. What is not told, I have a book out now called Righteous Troublemakers, and I told the story. What is not told is that nine months before Rosa sat out on a bus in Montgomery, there was a woman who sat down in the same town and refused to give us a seat up. And Claudette Cole. They did not rally around Claudette Cole. Why? Because they say, well, she's too dark skinned and she's pregnant and not married. And some of us, with our purest, dividing, conquer attitude, would not rally around Claudette. But then the secretary of the NACP, Rosa Parks, who was secretary of the government, got the same lawyers Claudette Fred Gray before everybody's came, and decided she would take that stand. As she sat on the front of that bus and refused to give up her seat, I was there one day, she told the story, and all I could think about was Emmett Till. These tragedies inspire movements, and you've got to learn how to take pain and turn it into power. So we went through the legal fight, and 
30 March we won that. The, the movement started around public accommodations, around sitting in front of the bus with, with Rosa Parks. An unknown minister had come to town named Martin Luther King, led the boycott. And they said we better to walk in dignity than ride in shame. A moral movement where our values and what we stood for was more important than our positions. And they broke that bus company and it began the public accommodation movement. Now, what you need to understand is that everybody was never in one movement. By the 1960s, which was coming out of the Montgomery boycott, we had the students who were doing freedom rides. We had Dr. King and the ministers who were fighting and had formed Southern Christian Leadership Conference. We had COVID, we had the NAACP. This whole notion that we only had one black at a time has never been true. There's always been variations. I tell young people today, there's nothing new about young activists and grassroots activists and tradition. All of that was always, don't let folks that are on the other side tell you your history. We've always had different approaches, but we always had enough sense to sit down and plan on how we go get where we're going. You may take this road, I may take this road, I may have this track, you may have another, but let's agree on where we're trying to go. Amen. We are in an era right now, getting to the subject of today, where much of what was fought for is at risk. Yes, Just like backlash during Reconstruction, backlash with lynching, backlash with uh, or fighting for public, public accommodation, backlash for public education. We should have expected, after electing and re-electing the first black president, that we're going to be back there. Anybody that studies history, I tell Obama all the time, my fear is not what we got to fight now, because he had to fight for every little thing he got. My fear is what's going to come behind him. Because history tells me there's going to be a backlash. Yeah. They started while he was there, Teapot, fighting against Affordable Care. And they needed it as bad as we did. They hated Obama so they were doing their mama. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why they wouldn't call it Affordable Care. They called it Obamacare. Yeah. And backlash came. They put up someone who blatantly played the racial fear, Donald Trump. Donald yeah. Trump, many years in New York, when there were five young blacks and Latinos falsely accused of raping a white woman in Central Park in the middle of Manhattan. Trump took out ads in the newspaper calling for their execution. One of the few bills he paid, he paid for those ads. <laughs> So we knew he'd been sued, he and his father, Fred Trump, for racial discrimination in their house. He played on white fear, make America great again. Well, great win. And great for how, but he was, it was the dog whistles to vote for me and I'll turn this around. And he did. He came in and put 300 judges on the federal court. He put free on the Supreme Court. Everybody reacting to his clowning and his behavior and his tweet in the middle of the night, but not looking at how institutionally he began breaking down all of the things Obama and others had done. Right now, we will, for the next two generations, be facing Trump judges in the federal court and in the Supreme Court. Right now. Right now. It's a six to three Supreme Court conservative, half of them come from Donald Trump. Biden has committed because of Jim Clyburn and some of us put a black woman on the court. She will still be in a minority, a two to one conservative court. In this session, they have got a case on affirmative action. They have a case on Roe versus Wade. All of that can be reversed right now. So the question becomes, as we look at 37 states, changing the voting laws. And the Supreme Court just upheld what they did with gerrymandering right in Alabama. They're not going to disturb it. So while we're sitting around talking about we awoke and we this and that, 
They're chipping away at us, and right now we need people that are serious and sober yes, about dealing with the issues of yes, today. Yes. We must fight to restore and maintain our voting rights. We must fight to build our economic institutions. Yes, sir. And we must preserve our educational institutions like Miles College. There is a reason that they have all these bomb breaks at HBCU. They want to scare folks from coming. Because if they can take race out of other colleges and, and have you afraid to go to HBCU, you will not know who you are, you will not know your history. And you will be fighting those that you ought to be following or be prepared to leave based on the history because you already, people your age, students, were the ones that fought and were the freedom riders in, in a, a public conversation. Your age. You don't have to get old to fight. And this whole generation of fight, old school, new school, it don't matter if you don't control the curriculum of the school. <laughs> Whether you old or new, and, and then they, they, they also get into the cultural beatdown. Now, some of y'all are going to disagree with this, but I'm going to say it anyhow, because I'm reading in about a half hour. So, y'all are going to go out of your friends. The cultural breakdown. When we were growing up, we, the culture reflected the movement. Jane Brown said, I'm black and proud. He was most uh, young, gifted, and black. There was a culture movement, Marvin Gaye, what's going on. They now come with every song beating us down, N-word, H-word, B-word. So how does, how do we go from being some more young than black to every rap calling our sisters hoes and beat? And if you put that in a child's head, that they brought up thinking their mama ain't nothing but a bitch, and if we ain't nothing but business, how do you then supplant later pride and self-esteem? I understand you, 19, 20, you, you understand the difference. But what about that three-year-old kid yeah. that learns that lyrics? That becomes his self-image. Yeah. My daddy left my mother raised my sister and I welfare, single mother, food stamp. But we was humming black and proud. He couldn't tell me <laughs> what I could be, because Jane Brown told me I was black. Yes, but what do you think we put in these kids? I remember when I came out, she had a tax and said, we need to stop the N-word. All of us are using it. We need to stop the N-word, shut the music and get off. Some of my friends in hip-hop, I come up with rap started. All of us was friends. Russell Simmons, and Run DMC, and Spike Lee, all of us out of New York grew up together. They all got back other than Spike. They calling me, some of the artists you would know if I call their name, they're going to call me on the car. We have a meet, about 12 of them. And they said, you understand right now? I said, what? He said, we have freedom of speech. We can say what we want. I said, you do? He said, yeah. I said, all right. Let's go to the studio tonight and cut a record against Irish or Jew yes, or gay. Yes, sir. Or Polish, yes, and see if the record company put it out. <laughs> you only have the right to call yourself an N-word. Mm -hmm. They put their head down because they know. Michael Jackson, who was very close to me, I preached his funeral. Michael Jackson said something they, they thought in the record was offensive. I was there. They made him go back in the studio and recut the record. Mm -hmm. He was the biggest pop star in the world at the time. They don't allow you to do that because they understand that the music and the culture tell you who you are. Yeah. Ain't no accident that most of these flicks that we watch in live stream got blacks and drug dealers and shooting up. And, and all, I, my, my daughter's got me watching some power stuff. I said, well, what do you I mean, is everybody going to get killed in this? <laughs> Nobody got a job. Everybody's selling dope. <laughs> and then the man's son will take over the dope, and then the cousin and the mama will take over. I mean, whatever happened to blacks with a degree? Yeah. And the thing 
here and got these verses, man, I couldn't tell them. I, I, I should have told them, but I'm going to tell them. It's last Monday. It's back. I called one of those rappers that was in the room, beat me down 15 years ago. And I called him, House of Beverly Hill. And I called him and he got on the phone. Rip out, you saw us yesterday. I said, Yeah, y'all did good. Halftime of Super Bowl. Yeah, man. You ever think we have rap Super Bowl? I said, No, it was great. I was, it was wonderful to see y'all there. I said, But you know somebody was finished. He said, What? I said, I watched the halftime show. And I didn't hear y'all say, nigga, hold on, it's one thing. <laughs> so you can clean up yeah. for him. Well, well. But you can't clean up for your brother. <laughs> he got real quiet. <laughs> Time to now. Yes, we need to, in this era, be lifting each other up. Yeah. And telling each other that we can do whatever we want to do because we've done it before. Yes. But right now, look at what they're doing. They're changing the laws. They beat us on the voting day. They beat us with a, a verdict. I didn't like they only gave one or two years for Dante Wright in, in uh, Minnesota last week. I preached his funeral. You know I didn't like it. But we have fought worse than this. When we all got together and decided to fight. That's why now is the time. Always remember, I go back to the beginning and then I'll stop. Those that made it here from Africa in 1619, chained together, going across the Atlantic. There was a pandemic then. You chained the people. Then on one side of you might have died. On the other side of you have a disease. And you can't even get them off you. You just got to ride with death around you. Sick. Had to relieve their body. Couldn't get up and go to the bathroom. Change. Yet the strong made it. Yes, sir. We are in our veins the children of the strongest people in every world. that took more than anybody in recorded history. Yes, so you can take this and turn this around. Yeah. 1963, they fought right up the block in Birmingham and fought against public accommodations. Killed four girls in the 16th Street Baptist Church. History gives it to Dr. King, but the local leader was Reverend Fred Shuttleworth. That's right. And Shuttleworth House was bombed. But they changed this country, and by 64, we had the Civil Rights Act. And last night, I landed in the French Shuttlesworth Airport. <laughs> in Picard, Senegal, they have the slave camps. And I went and saw where they used to keep the slaves and had a room that maybe would come to me, had 60 people, they would jam 300 there, and they would hold them there until they both would come and bring them to America. And they bring them to an arch called the door, no return. Yes, sir. And they knew when they went through that arch, they were either going to die in the Atlantic or make it to the United States and be slaves. And I stood there with tears in my eyes looking at the door, no return, when my ancestors came through. But I lived to see a black president come and stand yeah. at the door of the old term. Yeah. He came back to the president of the Don't underestimate what we can do. Yeah. If we build and stay together, we don't have to all agree on the strategies and the tactics, but we've got to agree that we cannot tolerate where we are and that we must organize. So don't just study black history, make some. Yeah. Yeah. Don't just talk about back in the day. Use the strength of back in the day yes, yes. and say, you don't know who I am. I'm the children of those that turned around the most powerful country in the world and we can do it again. My last line for real being is that I remember in 2004, I ran for president and we had the Democratic debates all over the country. One night, President Knight, we were in Detroit at the Fox Theater. 
and we had a debate. I'm running against Governor Bob Grant. I'm running against Senator John Kerry, Senator John Edwards, Howard Dean, former governor of Vermont. And we debate, and we debate, and it's on TV. I'm coming off the stage, and I never get a reporter from the Detroit Free Press came over. He said, Reverend Al, I said, yes, sir. He said, you did good. I said, thank you. He said, no, I think you won the debate. You've been holding me on. I said, well, thank you. And I'm rushing on to get where I've got to go. He said, you ought to be proud of yourself. And I stopped. I said, I should be proud of myself for what? He said, when you stand up there and debate the governor and the senators, he said, you ought to be proud. I said, they ought to be proud to be up there with me. <laughs> And he got confused. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you got to remember, everybody on that stage, other than me, came from a background of finances and political power and judges. They were born on third base. All they had to do was hit a single and get home. I wasn't even born in the stadium. I had to come through the parking lot down to the get on the field and cover all bases. <laughs> but we all on the same stage yes, now. Yes, it yes. means I must be stronger than them. Yes. And I must be smarter than them. Yes. They had to come through. Yes. If they had to come through what I came through, they may not have made it to yes. Don't be ashamed of what you come through. Yes. Yes. I grew up on welfare with food stamps. Yes. But folks now with PhD watch my television show. Don't let nobody beat you down. Turn your pain into power and let's deal with making black history right now. Okay. 
Yeah, she's looking right down there at the gender camp. Amen. Amen. God bless you.